Philip, we're happy to be here with you today. Um, the theme of today's presentation is what you see there. You know, don't let fear steal your dream of business ownership. So thank you again for this opportunity. It's our pleasure, Terry. Thank you for being on. All right. So let's see. Going on to my next slide here. All right, just briefly a little bit about myself. I'm born and raised in San Antonio, uh, graduated from UT of Austin with a degree in management. Uh, just like many of you, perhaps I was in corporate America for many, many years, over 30 years. Uh, during that time, I worked with all the time with an insurance company, helping business owners with their business, grow their business, and then helping future agents kind of understand the business and work on their business plan. So it was a great fit for me to just switch over and become you know, my own boss as a FranNet consultant with FranNet. Today's agenda, we've got a packed agenda. Uh, just a little bit, we're gonna go over the current environment that we're living in, uh, review some survey from some prospective buyers that were done. Talk about a timeline, what would a timeline look like? Um, go over some franchise highlights and then we're going to have Christian Gordon tell us about how to fund your business and last but not least James Adams is going to talk about his journey uh, to franchise ownership so just very briefly about Franet you know we've been around for 31 years uh, we have consultants all across the country over a hundred so we're local so we like to say we understand the market we know the market because we live in the market we have national partnerships with SCORE and SBDC. And what we do is we match people with a business that fits their needs. So I like to say, if you think about what eHarmony does for couples, that's what we do for people, have the best match for someone. Most importantly, our services are 100% free to you, the client. Full transparency, we are paid by the franchisor if you should decide to buy a franchise. So a little bit, I think, you know, we need to cover this because it's the elephant in the room. You know, we're going through a difficult time right now. It is COVID. And so, you know, let's address the elephant in the room. So it's a challenging time, yes. And there's definitely some uncertainty about the future. And most importantly, you know, deciding to buy a business or a franchise, that's a life-changing event. So there's a lot of things to consider and we don't take that lightly. And I know you don't. But today we wanna to just share some insights that we've heard and things we're seeing and, and let you decide, you know, this might be the time to start the research process uh, for your own opportunity for business ownership. So gonna, the next couple of slides are gonna go over some surveys that were done. Uh, this was all from, if you see the source below, the Small Business Startup Sentiment Index. And so they take this poll every month. So these were the results from June. So the most recent. So 66.4% of those surveyed think now is a good time to start a business. Either they agreed or strongly agreed. But compared to March when it was 55%. And then 55.9% expect to start within the next three months. Another question that was asked, you know, how is COVID affected your intent in starting a business. So, you know, they were trying to test their desire to control their own destiny. So in March, it was 27.9% that they, someone, they wanted to control their own destiny. It's gone up in June again to 38.3%. And I think a big part of this is because people are understanding, you know, with the way the economy is and unemployment, job security is kind of a thing of the past. It's more about income security and planning for your future. The last but not least question, you know, have you decided to put your business on hold? Well, March, when all this first started, you know, 19.25% of participants said yes. Compared to a huge decrease in June, 7.1% uh, fewer people decided to put their business on hold. And this kind of correlates to uh, what we saw as an organization in June, we saw the most placements ever. That was our best month ever uh, this year. So it does correlate to what we're seeing. And I think, you know, maybe perhaps the tide might be turning. So how, you know, how do we use this time? And we understand people are at different places, right, in their journey. Uh, we've had people that were in the process that, you know, hit the brakes, you know, red light. I, I don't want to go further. I just want to see where this goes. And we totally understand that, right? We want to be where you're at and how you're feeling. But then on the other extreme, we have people, you know, that have, 
are still on the green light saying, you know what, this is the time to take advantage. Um, you know, we're at home now, people are working from home, we have time to do our research. Let's take advantage of this time and go full speed ahead. Let's take advantage of the low interest rates, uh, the increased occupancy in certain uh, strip centers because, you know, unfortunately some mom and pops have not made it or are not gonna make it, so there'll be uh, opportunities for space. And just, you know, they wanna be ready for, the, for when things come back around. So we understand, you know, wherever you are in your journey, you know, it's okay. But also remember that searching for an opportunity or researching one is not the same thing as committing. So you're not committing in any way, you're just doing your due diligence. So, you know, there are many things out of our control, but there are some things that are in our control. And we know that timing is everything, right? Timing is important. But if you take a step back, and look at, you know, where do you want to be a year from now? So in June of 2021, do you think that restaurants will be, you know, at full capacity or have 100% capacity? Will big box gyms and fitness, uh, boutique fitness, you know, be 100% and salons, you know, everything be back to, you know, kind of normal? You know, there's a good chance that it could be. So, if you, um, so what we do have control of is our, the timing of business ownership. So, you know, it's very possible that things could be back to normal next, a year from now. Just yesterday, I saw an article in the New York Times that said there was three competing laboratories that had some promising results on human trials for the coronavirus vaccine. Now, they're not predicting when it's gonna be, nobody can predict when it'll be ready. But what they were saying is it's faster. The, the progression of which, uh, the speed of which they're coming you know, to some deadlines or timelines is promising. So with all that said, you know, the future can be bright. So let's say, you know, we'll have a scenario here. Let's say that you want to open a business in January of 2021. Okay, let's say you've either left corporate America or you're thinking about it and that's your timeline. Now, you can, you can start a business sooner, but I'm being very conservative, you know, because people want to move at a slower pace. But let's say it's January of 2021. So that is your goal. So let's work backwards. What would have to happen before you open your doors in January of 2021? Well, you would have to go to training Training would probably happen in November uh, before the uh, holidays, right? So get the training done. Before you go to training, you've got to sign your contract, right? And in order to sign any kind of contract, you have to uh, have your financing in order. That's where Kristen's going to talk about that. But in order to know what financing you need, you need to understand, well, what franchise am I going to purchase or am I interested in, right? And in order to understand or select which franchise, you have to start researching your options. And that can be done right now, right? Because research is not just a week or two. A research is talking and interviewing the franchisor. It's talking to many different owners that are living the life and asking them questions. And it's also, um, we'll talk about this later, but reviewing a document called FDD, Franchise Disclosure Document, to really understand what's your obligation and what is the franchise or obligation. So many things have to happen to do that research in order to, but it's, it's a very doable timeline to start a business in January of 2021, okay? So why business ownership? Many people, uh, there's various reasons. Everybody has their own reasons. But kind of we want to take a little poll and, you know, what is it for you? What is motivating you to possibly look at business ownership? Uh, Philip, I think we're going to pull up the poll. Yes, here we go, Terry. So if okay. you could please take the poll, we'd appreciate it. And uh, we'll share the results as soon as we have them. Thank you. All right. I think 
All right. So the, the two that came out is flexibility. Well, we got three. That's great because like I said, everybody has a different reason and they're all good, valid reasons. Flexibility, that was my reason. Uh, flexibility, because I was in corporate America for so long, I didn't want to be constrained to somebody telling me my schedule. But independence and control, I also hear from many of my clients. They say, I want control because I want to spend more time with my family and independence to do what I want to do and how I see it best done. So thank you for doing the poll. I appreciate that. Um, again, you know, everybody has their own reason and passionate about their reason. All right. So one of the things, uh, what we're seeing um, is the hot buttons for our clients are now are, okay, let me look at a business that is somewhat recession resistant or is not affected by social distancing. So we are seeing some positive things with service-based business, you know, like pool service, cleaning service, painting business, where there's, you know, people are at home more. So they're looking around their house saying, what do I want to do? Do I want to remodel my bathroom, my kitchen? I need painting inside or out. All these things are getting done while they're at home. So those businesses have kind of sustained their growth. When you look at essential services, you know, automotive, we're still having accidents, right? And cars are breaking down. So that's still an essential business. That franchise is still operating. Uh, sign companies. Wow. We got an email yesterday from one of our franchisors that we work with that his owners across the board have having their best year ever. And why is that, right? Look everywhere you go to a business, uh, especially restaurants, right? Takeout, delivery, we're open, a stand here, stand there, you know, six feet distancing, all that is made by sign companies. So they're doing tremendous uh, in this time. And then also we're seeing uh, B2B businesses, uh, coaching businesses uh, are doing well digital marketing people are now saying okay i need to uh things i put off on hold i want to get into more marketing more social media be more presence advertise my business so those these are all businesses that are really thriving even in these difficult times you know to start a business there's really three options you have you can start a business from scratch you can buy an existing business or you can buy a franchise so today, for time's sake, we're just going to cover uh, a franchise. And there's advantages and disadvantages for both, right? All three have advantages and disadvantages. The franchise, of course, the main one is the brand recognition, the trademark, right? A proven business system. One client it described it as a template, which I really loved that word because he said, if you just follow the template, you're going to do well. Uh, training and support. Uh, tremendous training, not just when you, uh, right before you open your doors, but throughout the career. Uh, financing options that Kristen will talk about. Uh, we are regulated by the Federal Trade Commission. So there is a document called Franchise Disclosure Document or FDD for short, that every franchisor must give a prospective buyer to review. It's about 200 pages, but it has all the obligations that you have and the franchisor has everything you need to know they're very transparent and they have to be from litigation to bankruptcy to listing all of the owners uh to even financial performance um so all that information is in that document also you know it's a franchise family so instead of just being in a bubble by yourself you have the camaraderie of your peers and the support of your franchisor and never before have we seen this more apparent than when COVID first started in March. So we've heard things where franchisors were helping their franchisees file, help them file the PPP, helping them negotiate a lease reduction or abatement, uh, helping them communicate with their customers. And last but not least, helping them pivot, especially some of these boutique fitness, right? Where they couldn't come in, turn around and um, pivot their business so they could survive. So tremendous, tremendous support. Now, when you look at disadvantages, you know, it is a structured operating system. So if you're a rebel and don't like to follow the rules or follow that, then this is probably not a, a good option for you. But it's a plug and play, you know, they've tried and true system. So you can't just go rogue and sell your own product or add a product or a different service. You've got to follow what the franchisor has put together. 
uh, territory restrictions. Now that could be, I see that as a plus two. So once you buy a territory, you exactly know the boundaries. No one else can come in that territory. So you are protected, but you can't go in, in another one, but you just can stay in yours, right? And that protects you. Uh, of course, there's ongoing. What you're paying for, for all the support, is the ongoing royalty payments. And that is listed in the FDD document. That can be anywhere from 4% on the low end to double digits, okay? But you'll know in advance what that is. So truly, truly, you know, you're in business for yourself, but really not by yourself. I wanna briefly go over three, you know, a couple of most common myths we hear. Uh, Franchising is only fast food and retail. Not true. There's 3,600 franchise companies in 90 industries. And I kind of talked about some of those on another slide. So you'd be surprised at some of the businesses that are franchises. So it's more, much more than just food, even though we do have some food franchises. Uh, another one we hear is franchises are expensive. They can be. You can have one, 500,000, but you can get in as little as $70,000 in a franchise. So our sweet spot, what we usually see is from 100 to 250. That's where the range of where we see most of our franchises. And keep in mind that there's no correlation between the investment you make in it and your potential return. So just because someone invested 70,000 doesn't mean that their return is gonna be less than someone who invested 300,000. There's no correlation in that whatsoever. And last but not least, industry experience is required. It's really quite the opposite. They don't want you to have experience in that industry. They're looking for your corporate skill set, your business skill sets, what you've learned, the management, the leadership, the marketing. That's what's going to make you a successful owner. And probably James can speak to that later. But they don't want you to come. Let's say you have someone who loves working on PCs and they want to open a business with computers or IT. Well, they're gonna be wanting to do the work, right? They're, well, what about all the other stuff that comes with a business? The, the training, the hiring, the uh, numbers, uh, planning, strategizing, all of that has to be done. So industry experience is not required. That will be trained to you. So that's where the training part comes in. So don't feel like you have to go know about the industry that you're going into. And last but not least, you know, there's many uh, financing sources and people choose different routes depending on where they're at in their life and what they have available. So now I think uh, I'm going to turn it over to Kristen because she's going to explain more in depth. She's the expert on financing sources. So Kristen, I'm going to let you take it away. Perfect. Thank you so much, Terry. I know you've been a very valuable resource for a lot of our clients, uh, extremely knowledgeable about so many different franchise opportunities. Uh, and, and so many people find that valuable because you don't know what you don't know, right? Uh, so again, my name is Kristen Gordon, and I've been a senior financing consultant with Benetrend since 2012. Uh, and one of the biggest decisions that every entrepreneur has to face, aside from what type of business that they're going to operate, is how they will fund their business. And a really important part of determining that strategy is ensuring that you're adequately capitalized. So with the few minutes that I have today, I just wanted to highlight some of the common funding options uh, in today's environment, especially in the world of COVID-19. Uh, before I jump in a little bit about Benetrends, when I'm working with a candidate, my role is to learn about each unique situation. So it's important for me to take time to understand both the potential business uh, purchase at hand, as well as the individual's unique profile so that we can really determine what financing services or products are gonna best suit their needs in funding and wealth building. Uh, and that's something that Benetrends, my firm, has been assisting entrepreneurs with for over 36 years. Uh, and in our time, we've assisted more than 17,000 individuals individuals and secured more than five billion in funding for our clients. And one of the first questions that I always get with so many options available are, are, are what's out there? What's available to me? And it's really important um, now more than ever to ensure that your funding strategy is appropriate uh, and not just for the business, for your individual needs as well. Some things that we want to consider are, are your timeline. How quickly do you want to get into business? Uh, your risk tolerance. Are you comfortable accessing resources like your retirement funds? Uh, what does your credit history look like? 
Uh, what are your what are your assets that are available? Uh, exit strategies, tax implications, amongst other factors. Uh, what's efficient and economic might be a single solution. Uh, it might be a combination of, of several options. So some of the things that, and strategies that I want to touch on today are, are loan options available, leveraging cash, uh, and the ability to utilize retirement funds without taxes or penalties. I think we've been hearing the, the SBA uh, for short, or the Small Business Administration, all over the news for those of us that, that are glued to our televisions these days. Uh, and the SBA's mission is to help entrepreneurs start or grow their business. Uh, generally speaking, an SBA loan tends to provide the longest term and the lowest interest rate options available for a business in the startup or the expansion capacity. Uh, SBA loans in that space are typically referred to as the 7A program. And within certain loan sizes under the 7A umbrella, you might hear the program sometimes called the Fast Track Program or the exp Express Program. Uh, and with an SBA loan, you'll be able to secure loan amounts anywhere from $50,000 to $5 million. Uh, the current maximum interest rate is 6%. Typical loan terms are, are 7 to 10 years. Up to 25 years is available if the project involves real estate, and what's really important to a new entrepreneur is there's no prepayment penalty on loans with a term less than 15 years. And typically, when you're thinking about what, what the bank is looking for when they're reviewing a loan package and some of the qualifications that have to be met, if you're thinking about how to prepare yourself for applying for an SBA loan, we call them the five C's in the credit, five C's of credit in the lending world. Uh, the first being your cash injection, right? So the bank wants to see that you have some skin in the game. They don't want to just finance 100% of your projects. Typically, they're looking that you have the ability to inject 20 to 30% of your total project costs. Uh, collateral requirements. Uh, are you going to need to offer personal collateral, a payment reserve, um, credit history? Uh, do you have late payments, a bankruptcy, foreclosure? Uh, the banks are typically looking for credit scores of at least 680 or higher. To what Terry mentioned, character. Industry experience is one of the biggest myths. It's not a common requirement within the banking world. And, and to Terry's point, a lot of times, uh, if you have specific industry in that uh, experience in that industry, that doesn't necessarily make you the best business owner. What the bank will be looking for are things such as transferable skills or a management resume, experience in those different departments that are going to make you a better business owner. And lastly, this is really important in the, in the world of COVID-19 is capacity. Do you have the liquidity uh, to su support yourself and your current debt service through the ramp up period of the business? After you've made your cash injection into the business, what money do you have or income stream left over to cover your living expenses for a period of six to 12 months? One thing to note is the SBA doesn't directly lend money to business owners. Instead, the small business owners secure an SBA loan through an authorized SBA lender, such as a bank. And the SBA provides the bank a guarantee for a portion of the loan. And the intention here is really to mitigate some of the risk and incentivize financial institutions to lend money to small businesses. What's important to keep in mind is different lenders have different credit boxes or borrowers profiles that really appeal to them. Different appetites are what I like to call them. They'll have an appetite for certain industries or types of businesses. And this is for diversification purposes, right? Uh, based on their active portfolio, they have to make sure that they're not putting all of their eggs in one basket. Uh, and they also wanna take into consideration the environment uh, and their lending capabilities. So knowing which lenders favor the concept that you're interested in and would favor you as a borrower based on your financial uh, and personal history is really vital to ensuring that you don't waste your time going to the wrong banks only to be denied. Some clients find that securing an SBA loan goes more smoothly with the assistance of a firm that's, that specializes in small business funding. Uh, and a firm that's experienced in working with many different types of lenders nationwide so that they can assist you with the entire SBA loan process from application through to closing. 
Uh, and if you have questions about what loan size or total investment is appropriate for you or a specific project, uh, my firm Benetrends Financial, we can help you with, with a free pre-qualification to determine your fundability. Uh, I like to compare that process to pre-qualifying for a mortgage before you buy a home. And one of the greatest parts of that is we have a 97% loan approval success rate from the point of pre-qualification. Timing is really important to consider when you're thinking about applying for an SBA loan. Uh, Terry showed us a great infographic on what the process looks like and funding is an important part of that. Uh, the SBA process usually takes at least 45 to 60 days but that timeline can be significantly impacted based on the size of the loan uh, and if there's real estate or a remodel of a lease location, what's referred to as a build out is involved. Uh, and there's normally five steps in the SBA lending process. The first is pre-qualification, and that's really determining an, an appropriate project size and identifying lenders uh, available, and that takes about 24 hours. After that, a client will move into a stage of loan packaging. And much of that timeline in this stage is really dependent upon your responsiveness, right? How quickly can we gather uh, put it, the different packages that the bank will review? Uh, items such as your, your business plan and your tax returns, cash flow projections, your personal financial statement, and other SBA required documents. Once we have that all put together, you move to the third step. And the third step of the process allows the banks to review your completed package. And if it fits in their portfolio, they'll issue what we call a letter of discussion. And that outlines the terms the bank is, uh, is willing to offer you. Most banks will issue these sheets within 10 to 15 business days. And what that allows us to do is gather sheets from a bunch of different lenders so that we can compare their terms and select which one is the best to move forward with. When you've selected that lender, the fourth step is for the bank to formally review your application and have the underwriting team review the business plan. And assuming that, that everything stated in the application was true, the bank will issue a formal commitment to lend. Most underwriting departments take about 10 to 15 business days again to formally review the forms. And once they've done that, we're ready to get to closing, the, the last step in the process. The closing process typically takes about three to four weeks in most scenarios. Again, a lot of that is dependent upon the responsiveness of the borrower. A closing checklist is issued in this stage uh, and it has to be fulfilled in order to set a closing date on the loan. So clients have to provide different documents such as proof of assigned franchise agreement, executed lease agreements, evidence of cash injection, their general contractor proposals, if there's a, a build out involved, and other documents or, or insurance documents required. For those of you who are unaware, the Rainmaker Plan, it's also known as ROBS, or the Rollover as Business Startups, was pioneered by Benetrends in 1983. Uh, and the process is statutory law and was designed using longstanding provisions of the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974. And what it does is it allows entrepreneurs to access their retirement funds tax deferred and penalty free to invest into a business. Uh, it's a process similar to buying stock in a public company, except instead you're investing in your own privately held company stock. One of the biggest benefits of this program is that a client's able to access their funds tax deferred and penalty free, uh, which would be the case uh, if you, which wouldn't be the case if you were to pull that money out directly. Uh, so in the example on your screen, you're looking at an individual who had $200,000 in their retirement funds. Uh, and if that client pulled their money out at age 59 and uh, before age 59 and a half, they would first be hit with a 10% early withdrawal penalty, which would be $20,000. And secondly, they'd be hit with state and federal income taxes, roughly 30%, uh, which is around $60,000 in this scenario. So if I had $200,000 initially and I pulled that money out, that would only leave me with $120,000 of the initial $200,000 investment. Uh, and our Rainmaker program helps you save 
uh, that $80,000 that you would typically lose in that scenario. Um, for most people that I speak with, the rollover process is new to them for the first time. And what many people don't realize is that we can apply a lot of the same principles we experience in our professional careers at one point or another to the foundation of the Rainmaker program. There's really two pillars to this strategy. So for example, what if I left one employer and took a job with a new employer? If I chose to do that, I might also choose to roll my retirement funds that I had from my previous employer to my new employer. Uh, and as a result of moving that money from one plan to a new retirement plan, I don't pay any taxes or penalties for that fund transfer. Secondly, you may have worked for a company uh, where you had the ability to participate in their employer's plan and allowed you to purchase company stock as, as a, an investment option in that retirement plan. What we don't typically realize is the proceeds from that sale of stock become company assets uh, and you can use the, the company can use those funds for operating expenses as needed. So really putting these two pillars together, an entrepreneur can fund or recapitalize their business. And there's four steps we put together to make that happen. And you'll see those four steps on your screen right now. First, we establish a corporation with a customized retirement plan. Secondly, we roll over your current retirement funds into the new corporation's retirement plan. Thirdly, the new retirement plan purchases stock in your new corporation. And as a result of that stock sale, you are funded and your corporation has the capital to purchase or start a business. The program is really commonly called 401k funding, which can be pretty misleading because there's a wider range of plans uh, that are available to use with the process. Uh, two important things to note is that if your retirement plan is sponsored by your current employer, you most likely can't use the funds out of that employer's plan uh, because they're locked in that plan while you're an employee. Uh, secondly, Roth IRAs are a post-tax vehicle so they're also not eligible to be used for this process. I think there's a lot of different benefits to this program, but some of the big ones to mention are that with the potential absence of debt, you're really poised to grow and succeed in your business faster. You can use pre-tax monies versus post-tax monies, such as a cash resource. Uh, we all know that cash is really important to reserve, especially in times like these. Uh, your credit score is also not a factor or impacted using this process. It's a relatively quick process also. I have a lot of clients who receive their funding in as little as 15 business days. Uh, if needed, you can use this program and take a salary as soon as there's an active business, such as when you sign that franchise agreement. Uh, and that can be really important if you're transitioning out of corporate America uh, into this entrepreneurial journey. We, we all know that you're still going to have uh, living expenses to take care of, mortgages and kids to feed. Uh, so that's another uh, really big benefit to this process. Oh, and another thing is you're creating a retirement plan as part of this process. And that can be customized over the life of the business to help you uh, accumulate wealth and provide a vehicle that helps to reduce, if not eliminate your corporate tax exposure. Uh, some even find that offering this retirement plan to their uh, eligible employees helps them attract and keep talented employees on their staff. One of the common paths to success that we see is clients combining financing options together. Uh, specifically, this Rainmaker program can be used in, in con conjunction with an SBA loan. Uh, and that can allow the client to use the cash for the equity injection uh, of the SBA loan, and it demonstrates to the lender access to additional working capital to get the business through the startup phase. Like I said in the beginning of this call, we're really looking at all of the financing options available to clients. So another potential loan avenue uh, or means to secure cash for the equity injection of an SBA loan 
is a type of loan that's backed by securities held in a, an investment portfolio. It's similar in concept to a home equity loan, but instead of the loan being backed by the equity in your home, it's backed by the securities held in your investment portfolio. So it allows you to collateralize that investment portfolio without disrupting long-term investments or asset allocations or creating unexpected tax consequences. And it can be a popular option because rather than selling stocks to buy a business, you, you can borrow against them and generally only pay about 2 to 4% interest. Though I recently did have a client who shared uh, after we discussed this that their portfolio manager offered them a rate of prime minus one. I don't think that rate will be around forever, but it was incredible to hear that that was being offered. Uh, again, this is a little bit faster than the SBA process, so typically clients receive approvals within 48 hours and they're fully funded within 10 days. Uh, some clients have the ability to borrow 70% uh, of the loan to value, some up to 95%. The only thing that I really encourage clients who are considering this option to consider is that it can be risky uh, if there's any market fluctuations that would cause the value of the pledged assets to decrease. If that were to happen, you really wanna understand the repercussions. Uh, do you have to pay the portfolio loan back uh, within a certain period of time? Uh, is your manager going to force you to sell off those securities uh, to maintain the equity? Uh, and that's something you really wanna consider, especially in today's environment. Lastly, one of, one of the, the more common options that we see are participant loans. But this can also be used as the equity injection component for an SBA loan if you're looking to secure a larger amount. This is pretty popular for clients who are looking to uh, keep employment with their 401k provider where their funds are, uh, if they're still actively employed by the uh, company sponsoring that retirement plan. Uh, and what happens in this scenario is you can take a loan for half the val uh, value of the vested balance of the plan, up to $50,000, and you're going to pay that back through after-tax paycheck deductions, typically at an interest rate of somewhere around 2% plus prime, most of the time at a period of a five-year repayment term. I'm happy to help with questions at the end of this call, uh, as mentioned, but I realize that a lot of times uh, questions regarding financing are, are personal and sensitive, and you might not want to discuss that in front of a large group of people. So you'll find my contact information here, and I know Terry will provide it at the, the end of this presentation as well. So please feel free to reach out to me with, with any questions. Thank you, Kristen. That's great information to know. I, I even learned something there, some other options besides the, the SBA or the uh, ROBS program. So it's always good to hear. Yeah, that's great. Well, now, last but not least, uh, I'm excited to uh, introduce James Adams. He is a uh, Hispanic Chamber member. He is a franchise owner with CMIT. He's had a, an interesting and awesome journey to franchise ownership, but I'm going to let him tell you about that. So James, take it away. We're happy to have you. Thank you, Terry. I, I appreciate it. And as Terry said, I'm, I'm James Adams and I'm the owner of uh, CMIT Solutions of San Antonio Northwest. Uh, and yes, we are a franchise. So, you know, franchises aren't just uh, restaurants and McDonald's and things. So we are an IT franchise that's based out of uh, Austin, Texas is where our home office is. Uh, before I tell you about the franchise, though, I'll tell you a little bit about myself here. I wasn't born in Texas. I didn't get here as fast as I could, but uh, but once once we got here, we we kind of liked it, and we decided we were going to going to stay. And this was a, a great place to uh, to raise a family. And uh, I spent 24 years, nine months, and five days uh, as a military officer. Uh, but but who's counting? But uh, so with that time, uh, you know, we ended up here in Texas and just fell in love with the hill country and decided to stay. Um, but I do have, even though I was born in Louisiana, I do have some ties to San Antonio. My great, 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 great uncle, or ever how many that is, uh, died in the Alamo. So his name is on the big monument out front there, Daniel Cloud. So I do uh, do think that San Antonio is, uh, or at least this area, is is home for us now. Um, you know, after I, I so I spent 24 years in the military and. Uh, I had a secondary in information technology, but I only worked about half my assignments in that. So 
I really, you know, I would never consider myself technical by any, you know, stretch really, you know, I, I have a clue about the stuff, but uh, I, my other people handle the details. Uh, but after retirement, you know, I really wanted to start my own business. That's really where my heart was. But if, you know, if you ever served in the military, that's a huge transition and to, you know, leave one profession that you've, you know, you've grown up in to start a new one. So I transitioned into corporate America because I wanted to stabilize my family. My son was a senior in high school and going off to college. And um, I just wanted to get stable uh, before I, I ventured out. So I went to work in corporate America, uh, worked with a fantastic Fortune 500 company doing uh, IT project management. Uh, it was really a, a, a great experience for me, a great transition for me to learn a little bit more about business and how businesses operate uh, in that, that part of the transition. So that was really, uh, really good for me. And I, one of the issues was, I, it, the reason I didn't stay was I was spending 50% of my time in New Jersey and 50% in San Antonio. So I was, I was traveling uh, quite a bit and, and about at the three year mark, the, uh, the entrepreneurship bug kind of bit again. I was, uh, my wife and I were in New York City for a, uh, and so I knew I wanted to do something, and, but I just didn't know what. So uh, about that time, we were in New York City on our, our anniversary, and our flight was delayed, and I was watching the, uh, the news, and there was uh, a lot of, uh, so there was a big cyber attack that shut down like Amazon and several of the other, the big websites and stuff like that. So I said, you know, cybersecurity, that has to be it. So there has to be something there. So I really started researching, knowing that, okay, I'm gonna start moving forward with this. And this is really where I wanna gonna hang my hat. I really wanna get into the cybersecurity side of it. So I started researching things on my own. And uh, I did come across uh, CMIT and, and saw that it was a, uh, an IT services company that also did uh, some, some cybersecurity and things like that. So um, I didn't discount them, but I said, okay, that's very interesting but I don't want to do a franchise. I want to do this on my own. I want to, uh, you know, I don't want to be uh, bound uh, by a franchise. I want to be able to, you know, exercise the freedom. And so um, a, a few months later, I mean, just out of the blue, I get a call from a, fi a franchise broker, a uh, really great guy. And I said, look, I you know, don't want to waste your time. I'm not interested in doing a franchise. And he, you know, he did not, put on a hard sell, didn't try to sell it or anything like that. He just said, okay, that's fine. He said, if you want to talk, and I was open to, to the talk. So, you know, he says, if you want to talk, let's just do a personality profile. Let's see what you have an aptitude for. And he says, you can, you know, take this and go to franchises, or you can take this and maybe think about what you want to do on your own. So we did that. And um, so the, the personality profile came back with about what I've expected. And he also brought back, he said, here are three, actually there were four, completely different type franchises. One was in IT, you know, one was in landscaping and, you know, something home maintenance type um, franchise. Um, one, uh, another one was in IT consulting. Uh, CMIT was one of them. So, and really that was the trick to me that says, okay, the broker kind of knows what he's talking about because had he not, brought CMIT because I had already thought I was a perfect fit for them. Um, I would have, you know, been a little bit skeptical, but uh, the broker really did help guide me in things that I had never thought about. And it also reminded me that I had all this great experience operationally and in the, in the military. And if you needed to make something happen, I knew how to do that. I knew how to move, you know, thousands of miles into the desert or wherever we got to go, you know, I could do that stuff, but I really didn't understand or have a good grasp on what it takes to run a business. So that was really kind of a, you know, one of the places that that broker really kind of guided me. He also said, um, so we set up, you know, interviews with all, all the brokers. He said, look, talk to each one of these franchises three times and you know do three phone calls with them and at least do one site visit with you know with one or two of them just to kind of see before you make a decision so i didn't just jump straight onto the cmit bandwagon i went into you know one of the, it's it was a uh, it was a high definition 
uh, large format printing uh, service that's in San Antonio and, and they do a lot of the banners for the Spurs. So I went into to his shop and, and, you know, had a conversation with him. I also did do a CMIT uh, one and I uh, went into another one as well, but none of those seemed to fit. I kind of knew from the beginning that it was CMIT. So he said, okay, now let's talk, you know, let's really, you know, uh, so I started talking to CMIT a little bit and I was really, uh, they're a great franchise. They were very family oriented and I'll tell you a little bit more about them in just a second, but they really did uh, bring me in in terms of they weren't looking to sell me a franchise um, and they weren't trying, they were trying to qualify me, but we were both trying to see. And one of the things the franchise uh, uh, rep told me in the beginning was we need to see if we're a fit for each other. You know, not so much that if I'm, a, you know, if they're, if, that they're just trying to sell me a franchise but wanted to make sure that we were a fit. So that was, um, that was really important. And for me, once I started doing what's called validation calls uh, and I started talking to each of the owners, I really did kind of feel a good sense of com camaraderie uh, uh, among the owners. And again, so I was always, and, and we're probably talking, we're at the, probably the four month mark right now. And I really still was not sure I wanted to do a franchise. So I said, franchises are expensive. So let me kind of figure this out. So I sat down and I said, what if I wanted to do this on my own, what's it gonna cost me? So I did a business, uh, did a business plan. And as I timelined it out and I got to a five year business plan, it was like, whoa, this is, uh, this is pretty expensive. Uh, I don't have the business experience in a lot of places that maybe I lack. So uh, maybe this franchise thing isn't so bad. I mean, the financial, you know, when I ran the financials, it was, it was actually a little bit cheaper going with the franchise and the upfront investment uh, that I was going to have to do. So the broker really kind of helped lead me to that, um, that piece of it. Um, and then from there, once we kind of said, okay, CMIT is the one, we like CMIT, um, how, where do we go from here? And that led me to, ironically, uh, Benetrends worked with uh, one, of, uh, one of Kirsten's uh, colleagues and we, uh, we worked out the financing and I had to do some pre, um, what do we, I don't know how to say it. I had to set the conditions for my financial transition. So I wanted to make sure I had, you know, my retirement money was, was set in a place. I wanted to make sure that I was financially ready to not take a salary for a while and, and just to concentrate on, on building the business. Um, and, you know, all of those things that, that Kristen was talking about there, you know, some of that stuff just goes way over my head. Maybe it doesn't yours, but the, uh, but Larry at, at Benetrend, the guy that I worked with a few years ago, really guided me through that process. And he said, step one, step two, step three. And at, at one point I almost had to say, okay, look, I got faith in you. Do it. Show me, tell me where to go. You know, and that's, that's kind of hard for, someone who's seeking entrepreneurship. And if you're that kind of person, you're not one to ask for help. You know, you're more of a doer and you really, you know, you drive forward and, and having to put your faith in someone and say, show me, tell me what to do. is sometimes a little bit difficult, but you know, that was a, you know, I would not have been able to figure out the financing side of it had it not been for, uh, for my franchise broker, uh, for uh, Benetrends brokers. So that really kind of helped me along that way. Um, and, and, you know, kind of the rest was, was history. You know, I, what happened was with, with CMIT was, um, they had a, an owner that was looking to sell. He was looking to retire and, and get out. So there was an opportunity to buy an existing territory, uh, or buy the Southern territory in San Antonio. Uh, we started talking with the existing owner, uh, things kind of, uh, didn't work out so well. So, you know, I, when I signed my agreement, it was to purchase the southern side of San Antonio as the territory, and about and and before I went to so after signing and before I went to training, um, the previous owner came back and we were able to negotiate an agreement. And my franchise, being the great guys that they are, said, "Sure, we'll just transition your agreement from the southern territory, so you just buy the existing territory, no big deal, and and we'll work that out." So. They were very flexible and worked, you know, worked well with me. They really could have said, "Nope, you're stuck to the Southern Territory." And other guy, you go sell to somebody else. But you know, they didn't 
didn't do that. They they really worked and uh, and it worked worked out well uh, for me, and ended up buying that territory. And I will say, you know, when you're buying an existing territory versus buying a brand new territory where you have to start from scratch, you know, one uh, an existing territory is more expensive because there's clients and uh, and there's money coming in. Uh, but the problem is because there's money coming in, there's clients that expect you to perform. They don't care that you just transition. So there was a, you know, you have to make sure that you're prepared to be able to do that. Um, and, and you just have to have the financial runway uh, to make it a, you know, a profitable business because it, um, it, it is, it, it's hard, especially for, you know, someone who, uh, who doesn't have a lot of business and sales sales and marketing experience, you know, that's really where, uh, where I probably struggled in the beginning. Operationally, I kind of had it from the beginning. Technologically, I had it from the beginning, but it was the, uh, it was the sales and marketing piece that, that really had to take off. Um, and you know, a little bit about CMIT. So, and I'll, and I'll kind of tell you a little bit about the company and then we'll talk about maybe a little bit part of the, the first part of, of ownership and how that goes. So CMIT, stands for completely managed IT services, CMIT, completely managed IT. That wasn't always the case. In 1996, CMIT was founded by uh, Georgia Jones. She was a former, um, she had been working in corporate America. And when her, kid, when her kids were born, she took time off to, uh, to raise her kids. And then when she put them on the bus going to school, she said, oh my gosh, I just put my kids on, you know, now they're, they're in school all day, what now? I've got, you know, I don't know what to do. And somebody said, oh, I got a computer problem, my printer. And she goes, oh, I know how to fix that. So she went over and fixed that. And then pretty soon she was helping people in the neighborhood with their computer issues. And it started kind of taking off. So she became a home entrepreneur where she was working with people from home about, with IT issues. And it just continued to more. So she franchised that. And CMIT stood for Computer Moms. IT services back in the day. So, uh, but, but Georgia, you know, led the company for, you know, the first 10 years probably until we transitioned from computer moms to completely managed. And now we're a business to business uh, IT support uh, company and have been that way, you know, for probably the last, I don't know, 14, 15 years uh, for whatever it's, uh, for whatever it's been. So, it transitioned over and just a, you know, a fantastic story that goes along with that. And Georgia spoke at one of our conventions recently, and she is just, a, just a very, you know, dynamic and unusual person. Just, just a great, you know, she founded this company and turned it, you know, and set the conditions for what we are, what we are today. Uh, so CMIT, what do we do? So we are uh, an IT services, uh, and that means a broad bunch of things. And cyber defense so uh, and compliance provider. Um, and what that really means is we will support your users. You can call us when anything breaks, when something doesn't work. Um, we have you know, a, a set of clients. Most of our clients are uh, attorney's offices, uh, medical clinics, um, a lot of government contractors that, that need compliance level things. We will manage that for you. You, know, you can call a lot of cybersecurity consultants around town and you know they'll they'll tell you exactly what you need to put in place but we'll actually put it in place for you and manage it and you know there's a saying in CMIT if it blinks or beeps in your office we're going to try to manage it for you so uh, we'll worry about the technology and you can worry about running your business or what you're good at and we'll just take on everything in your IT department and you could you know a lot of people just think of us as their their you know as part of their company you know, we're not just a vendor, but, but really a, a partner uh, for, for people. Um, and really kind of the top things we, that we do that we see on a day-to-day -day basis is user support. Um, the, the company calls it help desk. I just don't want to call it help desk because I want to focus on the user. Yeah, I can make a computer work, but I want the user to be satisfied. I want the, the computer to do what the user wants it to do not just do what it's designed to do. So, you know, we focus on user support, network management, and then all the security aspects that go along with it nowadays. And, you know, some, and, and now we, we now have a minimum set of security requirements that every client 
has to implement if we're going to take them on as a client, because our reputation, you know, when, when most small, when small businesses are the biggest target for cyber criminals now, um, we're the ones that, you know, have to, our reputation is on the line with, with every client. So, you know, we really work hard to do that. And I would not have been able to do that on my own starting out. There would have been a huge ramp up period. And that's where the franchise comes into play was there's a product stack that goes along with, with that. So, and, and so that's good operationally, but there's also a product stack that comes with purchasing power. So with, we're CMIT writ large with, we're 168 locations. Um, <clears throat> there's still a couple of states that we're not in, but um, you know, we have a lot of purchasing power. We're Dell's seventh largest customer when you look at CMIT. Now with Dell, sometimes that doesn't always mean a lot, but you know, we're a big provider for Microsoft. Uh, we're a big provider with Lenovo and, and all of the network. And there's a lot of other networking services that go along with that Barracuda and some of the others that, that we partner with and the, that are part of the part of the product stack that goes with that. Um, but I wouldn't have been able to form those relationships individually. You know, now I kind of know what a product stack needs to be. And yeah, I sure I could go out now and, and tell people what they need and probably go out and make uh, coordinations with different vendors, but I wouldn't have the purchasing power of 160 other locations that, that go along with it. So, yeah. Um, and, you know, people were talking about uh, experience uh, a little bit ago. So as I look at what experience, though, so I do have a little bit of an IT background from an IT management perspective. Um, I, you know, 20 years ago, I did coding and 20 years ago, I did, uh, you know, server administration, but that has long passed. <laughs> so my skills in doing that are, are, you know, I can understand it conceptually, but that's it. So I have, you know, I, my, my technicians, uh, they do all of, all of that. But what, what I see across the board in CMIT, where my experience lies, is the most successful franchise owners are not technical. They are uh, business owners that do well with networking, do well with marketing. Um, and I'll, I'll say sales, but, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't consider myself a salesperson. You know, I, I, a lot of times I'll point to my shirt and say, we're CMIT solutions, not CMIT sales. We'll provide a solution. And, and, you know, of course we expect to get paid for it, but you know, we're problem solvers and that's what we try to do. And that's really where I want to, it's really kind of where I hang my hat in terms of sales. I really don't, I, I don't like to do sales, but that's really where we, where we are. And that's how I approach it. So, um, and you know, so the, oh. yeah. James, I'm sorry. Thank you so much. I, I want to see if we have any questions because you shared a lot of great, you and Kristen shared a lot of great information. I want to make sure we get, you know, everything in, but thank you so much for sharing your awesome journey and, and hearing all your success. And most importantly, thank you for your service. Oh, sure. Of course. Uh, just wanted to share, before we get into the questions, I just wanted to share at the, a couple of more things. Um, let me get to that. Let's see. Brief, brief, let's see. Okay, so if you heard something that interests you or you just wanna explore, you know, commitment-free, the assessment that James was talking about, we also, we provide a franchise assessment. It's kind of like your business DNA. Uh, it takes about 30 to 40 minutes to complete. We'd be happy to, or I'd be happy to send that to you if you are interested. Also, we always like to promote some books that are really great entrepreneurial books. The E-Myth Revisited is awesome. Uh, Street Smart Franchising and More Than Just French Fries. Uh, we're also going to send you a survey, but if you'd like to take a picture of this QR code for a survey, we'd love your feedback. But again, uh, if you don't take this picture, we're going to send it to you uh, via the chamber. We'd love your feedback on, on a survey. And here is our uh, contact information, myself, Kristen, and James. If you have any follow-up questions, uh, please email us or call 